you. How many of you have downloaded the church app? Some of you, the rest of you ought to. It's a free app. It's paid for by the harbor. Are you with me? Say amen. So it's, it's paid for. It's, uh, it's free to you. You can use that to catch up on the latest uh, messages and uh, whatever it is you can give there. You can catch up on the blog. You can uh, do all kinds of things. In fact, we add things to that uh, app a couple times a week just as things come about at the church. The app is the mobile way to keep up with what's going on. You know, used to, when, when technology first hit, everybody had a big old desktop computer. I mean, a big old desktop computer. And then they got a little smaller, a little smaller. And then they come out with uh, cell phones and smartphones. And now the wave of the future is going to smaller and smaller technology. And so, as you well know, most everybody has some sort of device now. And so that app is geared for that mobile device, whether it's an iPad, iPhone, Android, or whatever. You can download it from the Google Store uh, or the App Store, and um, you can keep up with what's going on. I've heard good reports about people that have already done that. Um, let me tell you something. We're in the middle of the summer, and God is blessing us in spite of ourselves. Are you with me? Say amen. Uh, I talked to our former state overseer a few months ago, and he said, Pastor, do not buy into the lie of the summer slump. He said he told me how many years he pastored, and a lot of them was there at Brunswick there at Buckingham Place, which is Abundant Life now. And he said, I never bought into the lie that so many people said, well, you can't grow through the summer. And he said, I grew, or we grew every summer, every summer I was there in Buckingham. So um, I said, you know what, Pastor, I'm not going to buy into it this year. I'm, I, we're going to press on, and I'm going to tell you something. Our finances and our attendance has continued to push right on through the summer. 300 people here this Sunday with 22 families gone that I knew of. 22 families, not 22 people, but 22 families. And when I count a family as being missing, I'm not talking about people that show up once a month for church or even twice a month. You've got to have a good record of being here for me to count you as being gone as one that would. And, and I know this is crazy, but Tanya, Josh, Kelly, Adam will tell you I go through it every single week. I have a list on my phone. I know who's here and who's not pretty much. That's not, that's not a scientific thing, and it's not 100% accurate because the larger we get, it's harder to, to keep up. I may not have personally called you this week if you missed Sunday, but I bet your name made my roll book on my phone. <laughs> Amen. So uh, anyway, uh, but nonetheless, I'm excited about that. And uh, more and more, God is sending, um, s sending people uh, into our church. We had a visiting church with us. Pastor Chris Moore's church was here this past Sunday, uh, Emmanuel Empowerment Temple. Uh, Temple. Uh, I, I knew him uh, through another person. I didn't know him personally until I met with him for breakfast on Friday morning, but they come and met with us here in the green room about 30 minutes before service started, stayed through our singing. It wasn't like if you was back there and a whole tribe of people got up and walked out uh, a whole couple rows, there was about 15 or 20 of them. They weren't aggravated with us or anything. They just had to get to their place. So um, that's great. And we're going to meet together and do some more coaching and so on and so forth. And not that I've got everything figured out, because if I did, we'd have this thing already paid off and built the next one. Are you all with me? Say Amen. But I do believe that we ought to uh, share with others what God has given us and what God has blessed us with. On Wednesday night, not last Wednesday, because last Wednesday we talked about when the sea gets in the ship. But the two Wednesday nights prior to that, we began talking about the Bible, how we got the Bible, and can we trust the Bible, and was, how, how was it written, and was there collusion involved in it, and there are 40 different authors and 40 different areas or countries, and... 40 different generations, and just a lot of things that would prevent collusion or getting together. Um, you know, that's one of the things that uh, a trial judge wants to make sure is that witnesses cannot talk about their, their experience with one another and cannot get together on, uh, you know, the evidence, so to speak, so that they can't come up with some story. And our thing about the Bible is we don't want, you know, Moses talking with David and this one and that one and the other one saying, well, let's just write it down like this and say it's from God. I think I don't have time to recap it, but I think I shared with you enough to know that that couldn't have happened. <clears throat> it couldn't have happened because of the time that separated the writers and the distance that separated the writers and then the, uh, the integrity of the writers, the integrity, obviously, of the disciples and, uh, and those who wrote. But I want to go a little bit further tonight and talk with you about how we got our Bible. It takes a little bit of time to get through with this. And secondly, part B, can we trust that we've got God's Word? 
I would submit to you that we do. And although many people do not believe it and they don't practice it, I bet you um, 80 probably plus percent of people have one in their home, in, in this country anyway. I'm not saying they live by it. I, I, I'm saying it's probably on their coffee table or on their bookshelf. Uh, and just because you have it don't mean that you're, you're obeying it. Are you hearing me say amen? But um, I want to look at the Bible, and we talked about a, a word called canonicity. Uh, the Bible is called the canon of Scripture. Um, it has to do, the canon is that which is authentic. Now, for you and I, the Bible consists of 66 books. 39 books of the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. The Catholic Bible is going to have more than that in the Old Testament. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight because I don't want to leave you hanging with that. We're going to talk tonight about um, the so-called lost books of the Bible. And then, um, then I'll throw out another 50-cent term called the pseudepigrapha. Uh, and, and that goes alongside the Apocrypha. And I know these words are scary, but really, they're not that bad. The Apocrypha is simply um, what, it literally means hidden books or lost books. Now, they were written between Malachi and then the birth of Jesus. There's a 400-year uh, intertestamental period right there of silence. And there were some works that was written People wrote things and claimed it to be inspired. The, the, the Old Testament has an Apocrypha as well as the New Testament. And the Apocrypha for the Old Testament and the New Testament is nothing more than a collection of books that people wrote and kind of hoped that they would get included into the canon of Scripture, and they did not, nor should they. And I'll go through that tonight. Now, that's the Apocrypha, lost or hidden books. The Pseudepigrapha is books that were written that, for instance, if I wrote a book and I claimed that Moses wrote this, that would be called a book of the pseudepigrapha. Or if I had a book here that I wrote and claimed David wrote it. Uh, in other words, it, it's, it's been falsified. I ascribe the authorship to someone who, uh, we really don't know who wrote it. Or if I said Paul wrote it. Those books, and there's a quite a, a number of them in the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha, but, but the latter is when people ascribe a certain work to somebody. And, but there's no way of that. Let me, let me let you rest in this comfortably, that the books that are in the canon we know are inspired of God, and I'm going to give you the reasons why tonight, that, they, that we have authenticated those books, uh, that Jesus authenticated these books, and, um, and that there will always be people trying to make a name for themselves. Let me say this. Anything that's written anywhere and claims inspiration cannot violate validated Scripture. Are you all hearing me? I don't want to get too technical tonight. But uh, let me just say it like this. For instance, right now people may come to you and say, well, I have this new belief, this new doctrine. Well, if it violates the Word of God, it's invalid. Because God doesn't violate His own word. Let me help you. Uh, let me just move on so that I can hopefully get you to understand this. So such questions pertain now to the canonicity of the Bible. The word canon literally means rule or standard. These books had to rise to a certain level, a standard. That was the canon. And it was up here. No matter what books it were, there, had, there were... There were litmus tests, if you will, or acid tests that says this book has to rise to this level to be considered canonical. You with me? Say amen. And we had very, very smart men that was figuring this stuff out. I don't know if you know much about the old church when we were one, <laughs> back when everybody was Catholic. Uh, Catholic simply means for everyone and all people in all times. Are you with me? Say amen. It was the great church before the Protestant Reformation when we split. And uh, th there's no doubt that Catholicism had gone too far. The Pope cannot nor never could or ever will be able to forgive sins. You cannot sell indulgences. You cannot sell penance. You cannot sell God's forgiveness, period. I don't care who you are. So that being said, 
Martin Luther led us. I'm not talking about Martin Luther King, but I'm talking about Martin Luther, the great scholar, who led us in the Reformation and nearly lost his life because of it. And there's a great... I love this kind of stuff. My wife hates it, but when I was going to seminary, I'd bring home a documentary on Martin Luther and sit there and watch it for five hours, you know, and uh, watching him translate the Bible and uh, the hell that he went through and the places that he had to endure, the courts he was drugged before and all of that for his writings. You know, he's the one that wrote his 95 thesis and uh, nailed it to the door. Um, I believe it was at Wittenberg, but nonetheless, uh, he had to defend that thesis um, at the peril of his life. But nonetheless, uh, let, I don't want to bog you down too far, but there is a good documentary uh, called Martin Luther, if you want to uh, go rent that or get it on Amazon. Um, for early church Christians, it meant the rule of faith, that is the canon. Uh, in other words, what is accepted as authoritative scripture. The inclusion of any book into the canon, two things had to happen. It had to be proven to be inspired by God. You remember the word inspired? Breathe. As I said to you, if I had just chewed a peppermint, and I haven't, and you were right here and I was preaching in your face, you could smell the peppermint on my breath as I breathe these words. Kind of a crude illustration, I understand. But the Bible says that holy men of God spoke as God spoke to them, as God breathed upon them. They heard these words. They pinned these words down. So it had to have the inspiration of God. And God determined the canon by co-authoring the canon. Um, in other words, God spoke and men wrote. You hearing me? And then it had to be not only inspired by God, but it had to be recognized by men. So, um, man recognized what God had revealed and accepted it as the canon. Um, now, a book is not the Word of God because it's recognized by people. But it was accepted by the people because it was inspired by God and it was the Word of God. Are you all following me? Say amen. Um, so, so why 66 books? Um, so let's consider the question as it relates to the Old Testament. Number one, recognized by Jesus. Anyone who accepts the authority of Jesus will accept what he acknowledged as Scripture. I believe it. I mean, if Jesus were to come in here right now and he uh, opened a Bible and said, turn with me to the book of Genesis, or whatever book he said turn to, I believe I could pretty much accept that as Scripture. That's divine. I mean, if he's going to preach out of it, y'all with me? Say amen. So, anyone who accepts the authority of Jesus will accept what he acknowledged as Scripture. In John 5 and 39, he pointed the people to the Scriptures. Jesus constantly would, would mention things like, in fact, in, in my message just the other day on um, truth or dare, Jesus came back to Satan again and again and again, quoting and saying, It is written. It is written. In fact, Jesus would quote from all major sections of the Bible. Jesus would. Now, um, I'm going to break those sections down for you. Uh, Jesus, um, he spoke of the faithfulness in John 10 and 35. Jesus spoke of the faithfulness of the Scripture. Now, I want to show you something else that this is unique to me. It's amazing to me. The beauty with which the Scriptures have been fulfilled. Now, you've heard me say this, and I don't mean to, to beat a dead horse, but before World Book or Encarta or Encyclopedia Britannica or Americana or any of these, before they ever wrote a word about the rise and fall of Babylon, the Word of God wrote it. Before they ever said a word of the rise and fall of Egypt or the rise and fall of Assyria, the rise and fall of Persia, the rise and fall of uh, Media, the, the, uh, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. Before they wrote anything, it was written. Before, Britannica didn't say Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, but Isaiah did. 
I said this to our life group last night. We had a great time. And I said, let me show you how God uses world events. Did you know God uses world events? How many of you enjoy paying taxes? Let me see your hand. Well, I'm with you. I don't like paying taxes either. But Micah had prophesied that, that Jesus would be born uh, in Bethlehem, in the land of Judah. And so when Quirinius was governor, he put out an order that all the world should be taxed. Jesus was inside his mother's womb. The time was getting close as Joseph took Mary, his espoused wife, to Bethlehem, to the city of David, to pay his taxes. That's what brought him to Bethlehem. He would not have necessarily went where he was at, but he had to be there at a particular time, at a particular place, and there he was, and it came time for the baby to come forth. So she brought forth, forth her firstborn child, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger that the Scriptures might be fulfilled. How many times did Jesus say that the words of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, that the words of the prophet might be fulfilled? How many times did John the Baptist continue to relate back? So Jesus literally acknowledged all three major sections of the Bible. Number one, the Torah. That is, uh, the, it's called the Pentateuch. Uh, the Torah is... Uh, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's the Torah. And there it is. Uh, Jesus recognized that. And uh, uh, these books were written by Moses. And then he recognized what scholars call the prophets. You have the Torah, that's the law. The prophets is called the Nebim. Um, it is inclusive of the former prophets. Now, I, I, I had to really study this hard in school because I, I was thinking just the prophet Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, etc., etc. But there's more inclusive. It's more included in that. It's actually Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Samuel, Kings, Kings, and the latter prophets, the minor prophets. Are you with me? Say Amen. So, twelve minor prophets plus Joshua, Judges, First, Second Samuel, First, Second Kings. That makes up what is called the the prophets or the Nebim. Uh, then there is the, what's called the writings, the Kethabim. Uh, so the writings deals with the three poetical books, Psalms, Proverbs, and Job. The five roles, that is the Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Esther, and Ecclesiastes. And then several historical books, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. Um, Jesus followed, I want you to notice this, Jesus followed this arrangement uh, of the Old Testament uh, books that was customary among the Jews. We see this from his comments in Luke 11 when he's talking there. Uh, he speaks of the persecution of the prophets, and watch this, he says, from the murder of Abel. That takes us back. Well, for you're looking, you know, that it, murder of Abel way back in Genesis. And then he comes forward and says to the slaying of Zechariah. Um, this arrangement is the one that is followed today. In, uh, the, in the Old Testament or in the Hebrew Old Testament. Jesus does not quote from every book of the Old Testament, but he does quote from all three main divisions, uh, the Torah, the Nethabim, the Kethabim. He, he uh, the, the Torah, uh, the law, the prophets, and the writings. That's the easiest way for you to remember. The law, the prophets, and the writings. Say it with me. The law... Yeah, the law, the prophets, and the writings. This is all Old Testament. The law, the prophets, and the writings. Jesus quoted from every major section there. Now, every one of these sections was recognized by the apostles. Notice this. Paul acknowledged the Hebrew canon. Uh, he said in Romans 15 and 4 that it was written for our learning. In 1 Corinthians 10, he said that it was written for our admonition. In 2 Timothy, he said that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So we have the apostles that validate and, and accept all of, of the writings um, the law, the prophets, and the writings. So, um, 
The apostles frequently quoted from the books in the Hebrew canon. As they wrote in their Gospels, uh, they quoted again and again and again from the writers of the Old Testament. They quoted, uh, they quoted David. They quoted Jeremiah. They quoted Isaiah. They quoted Zechariah. They quoted Micah. They quoted Moses. They went on and on and on, and they quoted great men of God. Now, again, I draw this parallel for you. That how could all of those scriptures that were prophesied in the Old Testament fall into synchronization so smooth in the New Testament and come to fruition? How could it come to pass like that? I'm going to tell you something. Because it is the Word of God. Because God has orchestrated, God has put it together. Now let me go further since you hadn't caught on yet. Uh, but in their Gospels, where's the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That is the Gospels. Are you with me? A little quick learning here. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic Gospels. That means, uh, you know what a synonym is? Uh, synonymous. In other words, they say almost the same thing. Uh, you're going to find some, put, this, put different uh, emphasis on different parts. It would be like three of us guys going uh, to a movie or, or, or going on a mission trip and coming back, each of us writing about it. Each of us would write about the great baptisms that we did. Uh, we would write about the souls that got saved and the healings that we saw. But you would hear it from my perspective, from Keith's perspective, and from Kyle's perspective. You understand what I'm saying? We hear it from Matthew, from Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew looked at Jesus as the teacher of Israel, and that's how he portrayed him, the teacher of Israel, uh, the human face that Ezekiel saw. Um, and Mark saw him as a bounding lion, pouncing here and there. The portraits, if you go into uh, uh, a Methodist church or some of the old cathedrals, you will see the portrait of the teacher of Israel on a stained glass window. And Matthew portrayed Jesus as the teacher of Israel, the people's king, if you will, the people's teacher. Mark portrayed him as a bounding lion that pounced here and pounced there. Luke portrayed him as a burden-bearing ox that just plodded along. Are you all with me? Say amen. John portrayed him as a high-flying eagle. That's amazing to me that these writers of the New Testament used what Daniel saw in a vision, the face of a man, the face of a lion, the, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. Now, I know it's Wednesday night, but I'm about ready to start preaching. What kind of parallel could that be that Daniel, hundreds of years ago, saw it that way, and the New Testament writers portrayed Jesus that way? Ezekiel saw the glory of God, and he saw him that way. So now we have Ezekiel, we have Daniel, we have Matthew, we have Mark, we have Luke, we have John, and Jesus himself. Lord have mercy. But, and it goes on beyond that. But I'm just trying to tell you, in their Gospels, they reference the Old Testament. Now listen, they did not reference the Apocrypha. They did not reference books that were not included. They did not reference the pseudepigrapha. They did not reference lost books that claimed canonicity that was not part of the canon. But, but these guys referenced the work of the Lord. And uh, let me go on. Um, they were recognized by the apostles. Not only were they recognized by, in their gospels, but they were recognized in their efforts to evangelize. Do you remember when... Uh, uh, Philip, um, in, in, in Acts chapter 8, he was reading from a scroll of Isaiah. He asked, he asked uh, or the eunuch asked Philip, he said, is this man talking about himself or somebody else? And the Bible says, Philip opened his mouth and straightway preached Jesus. Who, 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 was, who was Isaiah talking about? Isaiah read like this. When the eunuch was sitting there and he opened up a scroll, he read. He said, I don't understand what I'm reading uh, uh, Brother Philip, he said, well, what are you reading? He said, he was reading as a lamb is led to the slaughter. So he opened not his mouth as a sheep before his shears is dumb. He didn't say a word. And, and he says, well, I don't understand. Philip, is he talking about himself or somebody else? And Jesus, or Philip opened his mouth and straightway said, Isaiah was talking about Jesus. And I'll bet you he carried him back over and said there was another place when he said, Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, and he'll save his people from their sin. The government will be upon his shoulder, and there will never be an end of his kingdom, and the scepter will never depart from his hand. 
In their efforts to evangelize, they referenced these books. In their epistles, now an epistle is just a fancy word for letter. The epistle of James, it was a letter to James. The epistle to Timothy is a letter to Timothy. Uh, so in the epistles, um, the, the letters that are written, uh, they referenced these books. So it's evident that Jesus and the apostles accepted the authority of the canon. They accepted the 39 books of the Old Testament. Uh, but what about these extra books? Well, here we go. The Old Testament Apocrypha. There's that word again. It's a 50 cent word. It literally means text of uncertain authenticity. Uh, uh, lost books, hidden books. Just remember it like that. Here's the description of the Apocrypha. It was written during that 400 period after Malachi and prior to Jesus. The books include, now there, there's a lot of them, so if you're taking notes. Uh, anyway, the Wisdom of Solomon is one of them. Ecclesiasticus is another. Tobit, Judith, First and Second Maccabees, the Prayer of Azariah, Susanna, Bell and the Dragon. Uh, Baruch, if you remember, Baruch was uh, a scribe to, uh, I believe, Ezekiel, uh, the letter of Jeremiah, the additions to Esther, Estrus 1 and 2, and the prayer of Manasseh. Then what you've got to understand is why you, you say, well, hey, there's a whole bunch of books here. Now, why wasn't they put into the canon of Scripture? Number one, there's blatant error in a lot of them. There's false doctrine in a lot of them. And none of them reach the measure of of the canon. The canon is the rule or the standard by which you must meet in order to be, if this top of this podium, if this is the standard, if this is the line, none of them got that high. The only ones that got that high is the 66 that are in the Bible. Now, uh, I'll have to give you the, the, the test uh, of how it is uh, when we meet again. But here's the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha was accepted by some people. In fact, the Council of Trent. Now, let me help you out with this uh, because it, it can be confusing. You had the Council of Trent, the Council of Nicaea, which was a big one, the Council of Chalcedony. Uh, uh, just on and on and on, these are ecumenical councils. This is where all the, the bishops got together of the great church before it was all split to ponder doctrine. To, it would be like our church general assembly, but, they, uh, but, but much bigger. Um, for instance... They, there was a great debate in uh, AD 314, I think it was, when they were trying to determine the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Um, th there was the difference in one letter, homoousian and homoousius, and I, don't make me spell that. Uh, I barely can say it. But one of them literally means of the same substance, and the other means of a similar substance. Only one letter difference. And I believe it was St. Athanasius that was saying, uh, that, that stood and said that the Holy Spirit is of the same substance of God Himself and Jesus Christ. Others argued no. You know, you had the church, um, uh, the division of the church, the Eastern and the Western church and all of that stuff. And uh, uh, nonetheless... Uh, if you go back and read that, there was a big fight on the floor. But eventually, eventually, they prevailed and settled the issue for the church at large and said, the Holy Spirit is indeed very God Himself. Not a separate, not a similar substance, but God Himself. That was settled way back then. Are you with me? Say amen. So, but the Council of Trent actually accepted in 1546, much later, because what I was telling you was way back at 314, I believe, I'm almost sure it's 314, the Council of Nicaea, you can look it up. With the exception of First and Second Estrus and the Prayer of Manasseh, while a total of 15 books in the Apocrypha, the Roman Catholic Bibles only uh, counted 11 of those that they included into the Apocrypha. Uh, the teaching of Estrus uh, uh, in opposition to the, uh, because they talked about praying for the dead and uh, you know, it led to the exclusion by the Roman church that, no, we can't have that one. So what I'm saying is when you start looking and finding big flaws in these books, you, they just could not be included. Let me move on so that you um, get a better understanding. Some reasons suggested for the Old Testament Apocrypha as Scripture, some of them said, hey, let's, let's, let's look at these. You had the early church fathers, and I don't know if you've studied this or not, but you had Tertullian and Clement of Alexandria and Irenaeus and... Some of these guys were saying, hey, we do need to look at them. 
Uh, even the Apocrypha was actually included in the Protestant Bibles, including the original King James Version of 1611. However, it was separated, saying that this is separate from Holy Scripture. But it might be good reading for you if you want to read it. Are you following me? Say amen. Uh, so, now, here's some of the reasons the Apocrypha was rejected. Uh, Jesus and his apostles did not accept the books as part of Scripture. In, in our estimation, it's evident because there are no references, period. No New Testament references to any of the Apocrypha at all as being authoritative. The New Testament writers quote uh, not one single part of the Apocrypha. Not one single New Testament writer quoted any of these uh, apocryphal books. Are you with me? And I just find that amazing because if you, ju if you just read Acts alone, look how many times Acts references the Old Testament. Look how many times, uh, you know, the Gospels reference the Old Testament. Not one single stroke of the pen references the apocryphal writings. So, Judaism never accepted these books as part of the scriptures. Ancient Jewish leaders specifically rejected the Apocrypha. So says Josephus, the Jewish historian, and Philo, the Jewish historian. While included in the Septuagint, now the Septuagint, remember, was this. The Greek translation of the Old Testament, because the Old Testament was written in what? Hebrew and Aramaic. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It was included in that, uh, however, they were never accepted as canonical, part of the canon. So I, I hope I hadn't uh, opened too much of a can of worms. I'm going to try to um, land this thing for you. The American Bible Society in the New Catholic Translation, in a footnote to the story of Susanna and Baal and the dragon, frankly admits they are excluded from the Jewish canon of Scripture. So... Uh, the Catholic translation and the American Bible Society clearly say they are excluded. Although they're in here, you can read them, do what you want with it, but it is not Holy Scripture. Um, while a few early church leaders appear to take some material from them, most were opposed to the inclusion of the Apocrypha uh, into the canon of Scripture, such as St. Athanasius, uh, great uh, man of God that stood and, and talked about that uh, one letter difference about substance. Uh, Cyril of uh, Jerusalem, Jerome and Origen, these early fathers says, no go, my friends, these are not inspired. The Apocrypha itself recognizes, watch this, our Old Testament canon as a distinct 24 books which corresponds to the Hebrew Bible as it is known today. Now, I, I don't know if you know it or not, but there was not chapters and verses when the Bible was written. That was added, that was added later to help us understand and comprehend it. If you ever notice, there are certain places I could take you in the Bible where it looks like a thought shouldn't have stopped at the end of this chapter, but it should have went on into verse 2 of the next chapter. Well, there you go. Are you following me? Um, so we could get into some real deep stuff and... Uh, we just can't get into it that deep right here. But um, in Estrus, um, this is an apocryphal book, 70 books are distinguished from the 94. That leaves 24, or the exact number of the Hebrew canon today, of which we get our 39 Old Testament books. I hope I hadn't confused you. So it takes 24 for the, for the Hebrew Bible, and out of that 24 comes our 39 books uh, they uh, include unbiblical teaching, such as praying for the dead, found in 2 Maccabees. They contain demonstrable errors. For example, uh, Tobit was supposedly alive when Jerome led his revolt in 9 931 B.C. He was still living at the time of the Assyrian captivity in 722 B.C., yet the book of Tobit says that he only lived 158 years. So when you find clear error, you cannot accept that. Now, I want to tell you something. It's amazing to me that the books of our Bible, the 66 books, have stood the test of time. 
You can mark it down. Every atheist and every scholar that's into science versus God, they have combed this Bible over and over, and it still amazes them when they turn up some city that they say did not exist. So they said David, for years and years and years, was a figment of Christianity's imagination until they found the insignia of his dynasty. Are you all with me? And then when they unearthed the insignia of his dynasty, the stamp of his dynasty, then you've got to do something about it. You've got to lend credence to what was said. There were so many places, they said, that did not exist in the Bible until they've unearthed them and proven that they did exist. And more and more and more. And as they dig more and more and more, the word, it does not um, X out the Word of God. It puts another check mark and says, I told you so. I told you so. I told you so. And let me tell you another thing, too. The, and again, how many of you know the world don't have a clue? But the very thing they are reporting on all the networks and all the news is a fulfillment of the Word of God. It is. Let me tell you something. God has the ability to prophesy things, and He did all through here. He prophesied things that would happen and, and things that would go on, and the world did not even know it, but it was coming to pass right there before their very eyes, and they did not even know it. God has a way of doing it. And matter of fact, if you were here this past Sunday, um, I, I shared with you how Gideon took a few of his select men. God had whittled the 32,000 down to 300, and they're back at camp. The Midianites are gathered around, and Gideon comes, and he needs a word of encouragement, and he hears one of his, um, one of the opponents out here, one of the men of Midian on the other side of the wall here, they're talking, and he tells his buddy a dream. He says, a loaf of barley bread rolled down a hill and came into a tent and literally obliterated the tent and crushed the tent, etc., etc. And his companion said, that is nothing more than the sword of Gideon and the sword of the Lord. Are you with me? I'm saying that was prophetic that an opponent spoke the very truth of God and didn't even know what he was speaking, really. And the next night, guess what? Gideon goes back and rallies his men and says, I want to tell you something, God is with us. I've heard it come right out of our enemy's mouth, and even he knows this thing is of God, and they can't stop it. Well, let me, let me move on. I need to try to land this thing. So... Uh, uh, they contain demonstrable errors, as I shared with you about Tobit. The first uh, official of the adoption of the Apocrypha by the Roman Catholic Church came at the Council of Trent uh, over 1,500 years after they were written. Um, when the Apocrypha appeared in Protestant Bibles, it was normally placed in a separate place. Um, and here's what Martin Luther said about the Apocrypha. Included in the Apocrypha, he did include it in his German Bible, but he introduced it with this comment, These are books that are not to be considered Holy Scripture. And yet they could be useful and good to read. But Martin Luther, the great uh, scholar says, or the great reformer says, this is not Holy Scripture. He was very, very careful to say that. I want you to understand this. No Greek manuscript, no Greek manuscript contains the exact collection of the books of the Apocrypha as accepted by the Council of Trent as, guess what we found at Qumran? You remember that? In 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls? I told you the earliest writings we had was 1,100 years old. Are you with me? But yet what we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls was we found copies all the way back 100 years before Christ was born with less than one half of 1% of any error. We're talking about handwritten copies on papyrus, not on a Smith Corona, which is obsolete by all standards now. Not on an IBM, which is obsolete by all standards. Not even on an Apple or a Mac, but on papyrus. Pen and ink, quill, if you will. So, uh, while the Syrian church accepted the Apocrypha with the 4th century, uh, the translation of the Bible into Syrian uh, in the 2nd century did not include it. The Qumran community that, that found the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls of Qumran had hundreds of books in its library beyond scriptures. Hundreds of commentaries, but watch this. No commentaries on the apocryphal books. They had comment. You know what a commentary is? A commentary is what I think about something. Uh, you know, if, I, if I've got Genesis 1 right here and then I've got my commentary, this is what Mike Sainz thinks about it. 
They did not have, the Qumran community did not have commentaries on the apocryphal books, but yet they did on Holy Scripture. Uh, just an, another tidbit, an amazing thing. So, um, while they did have some of the Apocrypha, they didn't have the commentary. So, uh, Qumran clearly considered the Apocrypha as different from Holy Scripture. Now, having said that, I believe that, that we have the inspired Word of God. And I don't think it's a mistake that in, in the last chapter of the Bible, that John the Revelator would write and say, do not add anything to this book or the plagues written in this book will be added to your life. Do not take anything away from this book, or your name shall be taken from the Lamb's book of life. Are you hearing me? The Apostle Paul would write, even if an angel comes to you with another word, with another message, with another gospel, other than this word that I've brought you, let him be accursed. I'm confident and, you know, uh, I think most scholars are, that we have God's Word for us today. Was there a pseudepigrapha? Yes. All it was was writings that people wrote. How many of you know? In fact, I believe Ecclesiastes talks about this. Uh, of writing books, there's never any end. I mean, books on books and books and books and books. How many of you know? Uh, and there are some books that... I remember I was going to seminary. I, I had to read a... Um, it was an expensive book, too. It was about this thick, and it was on psychology, and I hated it. And uh, one of the questions posed to us after we had to interact with all the class and all this stuff and write all kinds of pages of stuff about these cases. But in the end, he said, what will you do with this book of material? And I said, this will be the most expensive fire log that I have ever bought when I'm done with this class. Are you all with me? Say amen. <laughs> I did write it. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, some books... Uh, although they claimed authenticity was proven to be false. That's the pseudepigrapha. Books that's falsely ascribed to Moses or to Jesus or to John or Mark or Peter or Paul or whatever. Let me say this. We use literary devices to determine. I'm going to say this one. Go ahead and stand with me because I need to hush after this. But literary devices. How many of you know, how many of you got a favorite author you read after all the time? If you ain't got one, you need to get one. I like to read Max Lucado's works. Now, when I'm reading Max Lucado's works, I don't even have to have a book that has his name on it. I can read something and say, you know what, that sounds just like Max Lucado. Let me show you. We use what's called um, literary markers, textual markers. Paul, ha have you ever seen people that, um, that, that happen to, to say a certain phrase all the time? They say like, you know, and they go, you know it. And then they say a few more and say, you know it. Well, Paul, in his response to the Corinthians who had wrote him a letter, he's writing back to them, and he's addressing their issues. And he would say, this was a literary marker for him. And now concerning spiritual gifts, and then he would write. And then he would get through with that segment. He would say, and now concerning a brother, suing another brother. And he would write that for a while, and he would say, and now concerning adultery. And he would say, and, and, and now concerning fornication. And, and now concerning this. And, that, and now concerning, Paul had a habit of saying, and now concerning. And as you learn different guys that wrote had different literary devices. Some of them used rhetorical questions for which they don't want to answer. They just throw the question out there and, you know, nonetheless. So great pain has been taken to look at the text to, to form criticism, textual criticism, redaction, uh, and, and on and on to look and make sure we have the authentic Word of God. And I'm convinced that we do. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. I pray, God, that you would touch us tonight. Touch your people. Lord, I pray, God, I thank you for this.